Hi, everybody. How are you today? I am so excited to be kicking off the first ever Virginia Children's Book Festival Facebook Live Fest. My name is Anne Marie Pace, and I am a picture book author, and I have visited the VCBF twice, and it's been a wonderful, wonderful time for me to share books with kids. And I'm hoping that in this crazy time with the coronavirus that the Virginia Children's Book Festival as we bring kids to the festival every fall, that we can bring authors to you in your homes this year. And we are super excited that Facebook Live gives us the opportunity to do that. Um, I would first like to thank Juanita Giles, who is the founder and head of the Virginia Festival, uh, the Virginia Children's Book Festival, for putting this together. And um, I want to remind you also that after today, check the schedule because there are going to be lots and lots of authors. There's going to be an author Monday, Wednesday, Friday, this week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, next week, and after that there's going to be um, a, a whole new schedule because Juanita is finding more and more authors who want to share writing and reading and books with you all in your homes during this time of staying at home and cancel school. So um, I would also um, like to thank um, Chop Suey Books who um, will be, you'll be able to buy any books that you might like to um, that you hear about through them. And if, if it's not Chop Suey, please um, patronize your own local indie bookstore. And I would also like to thank Simon & Schuster, Beach Lane Books, and Scholastic for allowing me to share some books with you today. So I was trying to think about what I wanted to, uh, to talk about today. And usually when I go into schools to visit kids, one of the things that kids ask again and again and again is where do you get your ideas? And, you know, you can get ideas everywhere. So that's what I thought I would talk a little bit today. I'm going to talk to you about where I get ideas for my books, and then I am going to read a couple of them. And then if you have... Um, questions, you can put them in the the question thing. I'm not sure that I'll be able to see them as I'm going through, but I will certainly go back and look and, and try to answer them. But before we get started, I want to ask you this. Um, how old are you, people who are watching? Um, I, I see some names that I recognize, and I know that those are, are adults, but I, you might have kids in the room with you, and I'm curious about that. So I thought we would do this interactive thing, and hopefully it is working for you. Um, can you see it? Can you see where it says? Oh, people are answering, so I know it's working. Okay, so I want to start with my books today and talk to you a little bit about where I got the ideas for the books. You know, when you're in school, um, a lot of times you get ideas for a book because your teacher tells you what you need to write. And that is actually almost how I got the idea for my first book, which is called Never Ever Talk to Strangers. And this was a scholastic book. And my editor, Jenny Abramowitz, actually asked me to write a book about strangers and how to stay safe with strangers that you don't know, with people that you don't know. Because, you know, most strangers are, are nice, but some strangers you have to be a little more careful of. And so that was where this book, Never Ever Talk to Strangers, came with. Um, my next book was called A Teacher for Bear, and we're actually going to read this one in a little bit. And A Teacher for Bear is about, um, it was another time when an editor asked me to write a book. They asked me to write a book about a bear going to school. So that was you know, that was my task, and so I thought a lot about what it would be like for a bear to go to school, and that's, this is the one that I came up with. Um, a lot of you know this book. This is called Vampirina Ballerina, and it's probably my best-known book, and Vampirina Ballerina is a book about a vampire who wants to take ballet lessons, and where I thought about that was I was thinking about things that were very different from one another. When I was a teacher, I used to do an exercise with kids, uh, with my students, about things that were opposite and seemed very different from each other, like maybe a grasshopper, a little tiny bug, and a skyscraper, a big, tall building. And I tried to have them think about the things that were alike and different about a grasshopper and a skyscraper. And um, that's actually something you could try because it's, it's pretty interesting to think about 
really different things like that. So I was thinking about a vampire is very different from a, a ballet dancer and what would happen if a vampire tried to take ballet class. And that's where the idea for Vampirina Ballerina came from. And then there are there are three other books in, in Vampirina. So I already had this idea of a vampire ballerina. So then the question was, what do you what does she do, not just in ballet class, but in other parts of her life? And Lewin Pham and I both have children. Lewin Pham is the illustrator of the Vampirina books. And in fact, she's going to be doing a Facebook Live event in, um, I think it's, I think hers is next Friday through the Virginia Festival of the Book Children's Festival too. So um, Virginia Children's Book Festival. I'm sorry, there are two festivals that start with Virginia, and I was confusing their names. Virginia Children's Book Festival, right here on the VCBF page. So anyway, so we both had kids, and both of our kids love to have sleepovers with friends. So when we were talking about what might make a good Vampirina book, we decided that a sleepover book would be really fun. And in fact, one of the things that Lewin Pham said when we were starting to work on the Vampirina books was that she wanted Vampirina to grow and progress through the books, not just in each book, but throughout all the books. And so in Vampirina Ballerina, Vampirina has no very few friends. There are no friends that she knows. She is in a class with humans. It's very strange and confusing for her. But at the end of the book, she has friends. So in Vampirina Ballerina Hosts a Sleepover, the idea is that she has these new friends and she invites them over. And then the third Vampirina book was Vampirina at the Beach. And, you know, um, I have been lucky enough to have had a number of vacations at the beach over the years, and I love the waves and the sand and building sand castles. So, um, it, it the beach was just a really wonderful choice. And what Lewin Pham said when she was when we were asking her if she would do a beach book, she said, "As long as she can make an underwater picture, she would love it." And of course we had an underwater picture. And I love this one because there are just so many interesting things throughout the whole spread to take a look at. I love the pirate ship and the, the pirate up here looking out at everything going on. This is one of my favorite pictures in all the Vampirina books. And then the last one was for Vampirina was Vampirina in the snow. And we just, I mean, it was basically an, another case of opposites. We had done Vampirina at the beach, so now we wanted to do Vampirina in the snow, so it would be something very different. And we also thought it would be pretty cool if Vampirina could ice skate, because ballet is sort of like ice skating in that it's graceful and athletic and beautiful, so ice skating seemed like a, norm, a really good thing for her to do. Okay, so, um, and then Piglu. Okay, so Piglu is another book of mine, and this actually has a really, I to me, it's a really interesting story about where it began, because when I was in first grade, I wrote a story called, um, it, well, it wasn't called anything, it was, it was a book, a, a little story about a little boy who got on his sled, and he went up to the top of the mountain, and he sledded so fast, because this mountain was so huge, that he just kept going faster and faster and faster and faster and faster, and so that was, you know, it was, it, I liked it when I was six years old, and I wrote it, so when I became an adult, and I was thinking about stories that I would like to write, I thought, you know, I think I'm going to go back to that book that I wrote when I was six years old, and I'm going to turn it into a picture book. And that book became Piglu. And, of course, Piglu is not about a boy. It's about a pig. And the pig is wants to explore and find the North Pole. So it's a completely different kind of thing. So, so far, I have told you um, all these different ways that I have found ideas. Some of them are because they were assigned to me. Some of them were because I was trying to come up with something. This next one was at something bad that happened. I was out with my daughter and we were doing errands and I got a flat tire. Do you guys know what a flat tire is? I, just for, in case I know some of you are adults and some of you are kids. So just so you know, um, a tire is full of air in case there are some really small kids. Tire's full of air, it's a big circle, and if it hits a nail or a screw or a curb or something, that air, it can make a hole and the air will go out and it becomes flat and you can't drive your car if you have a flat tire. So um, 
So we had to stop and we had to call the um, tow truck and everything. And we had to wait for three hours, three hours before the tow truck got there. And it was so long, but something good came of it. And that was this book, Sonny's Tow Truck Saves the Day, which I really like. It's a rhyming book. And um, it wasn't the first book. No, it wasn't the first book that I rhymed. It was a more complicated rhyming book than I'd ever written. And I really liked that. So it was something bad that happened, but I made something good come of it. And that was this book. And then um, the this one, Busy Eyed Day, what was um, this idea was just because the words came to me first. So the words to the first bit of this book are big eyed bug stock eyed slug and it rhymed and i just i liked big and bug because they both started with a b and stock eyed slug because they both started with an s and they rhymed bug and slug rhyme so i just thought it was really cool and so those two things together i started with that with that little rhyming phrase and then it just went on from there and eventually it became a book about um a book about um, a day in the park. And we're going to read that one in a minute too. And the last one, Groundhog Day, um, this is a book that has a lot of holidays in it. And it literally got its start because a magazine put out a call for manuscripts and they needed some holiday books. It was highlights for children. And I wrote the story and it was called A Valentine for Groundhog. And they liked the story. They said it was well written, but they said they had enough Valentine's books. And I thought, I really like this idea. I don't want to give it up, even though highlights didn't buy it. So I decided that I would rewrite it into more of a picture book style rather than a magazine story style. And it became Groundhog Day. So ideas, they come from things you that happen to you. They come from words that pop into your head that sound cool to you. They come from assignments that your teacher or your editor gives you. They can come from anywhere. And sometimes it's a really, really small thing. And, you know, as you are at home for the next couple of weeks without school, your, your world is going to, it, it might seem kind of small because you are staying in one place. And so what I recommend to you is look really carefully at the world around you, even though the world seems small, if you're staying in your house and your yard, um, think about the small things that are special and that are unique and that maybe you haven't looked at something in that way before. Um, think about two things and combine them and, and compare them. And, um, and maybe it will come up with an idea that you can write or tell a story about. So, okay, so I would like to read two of my books to you today. And the first one is the one that I showed you, Big Eyed Bug, Stock Eyed Slug, from a minute ago. This one is um, Busy Eyed Day. And there's a little bit of glare. I'm sorry, but I think it'll go away when I open the pages. Busy Eye Day, I would like to thank Beach Lane Books and Simon and & Schuster and my editor, Andrea Welch, for allowing me to read this online for you guys today. This is a story about two kids. Their names are um, Zach and I am forgetting her name. I feel silly. I will, I'm forgetting her name and we will find it out in a minute and then I will go, ah, of course I knew her name. Um, that is a good place for you guys to hit the little laugh sign on your thing so that I will not feel as silly as I do for forgetting this character's name. Anyway, Busy Eye Day. It's about a day in the park. Oh, and it's about observing things around you. It's about all the things that you can see. So what I was just talking about with um, looking at ideas all around you in your world, that is, a, um, that is something you can do. Big Eyed Bug. Oh, I should say, the uh, illustrator. I'm the author, so I write the words. The illustrator is Fran Preston Gannon. Okay. Oh, one of you hit angry. Ah! Okay. Big eyed bug, stock eyed slug. Can you see the bug? There's like, it's like a grasshopper here, and it's a slug over here. One eyed Jack, two eyed Zack. So here's a man in the, in the park playing cards, and Zack is watching him. Closed eyed rider, wide eyed slider. Busy eyed day in the park. 
weary-eyed weeper, bleary-eyed sleeper. Blue-eyed Grammy, brown-eyed Sammy. Look, you can see, see this shadow? She's suggesting, the illustrator's telling us what's gonna come on the next page. I love that. Blind-eyed mare, cross-eyed bear, busy-eyed day at the park. Eagle-eyed keeper, round-eyed peeper. Have you guys ever seen those uh, telescoping binocular type things you can see distances for at the park? They're pretty cool. You put a quarter in and you can watch things far away. Side-eyed frog, wide-eyed dog. Oh my gosh, look, see the dog is chasing the frog and jumps up and ends up in the pond. Silly dog. That's something my dogs would do. I hear my dog scratching on the door outside. I kept them out of this room so that uh, we would not be disturbed by barking, but I can hear them scratching. Squirrel-eyed girl, girl-eyed squirrel, busy-eyed day at the park. I was told by um, my editor, Andrea, that this squirrel was Fran, one of her favorite things that she drew for this book, and I think it's just a beautiful squirrel, don't you? Two-eyed skater, carp-eyed baiter. Six eyes, eight eyes, see you later. No more spiders, no more bugs. Loving mama gives big hugs. So much to see, best place to be on a busy-eyed day at the park. Oops, that's a lot of glare there. There we go. There we go. And what I love about this illustration is that if you look all around, each little thing in this photo, in this illustration, in this spread, is something that happened earlier in the book. So, for example, right here is the pond. And up here is the horse and the carriage. And over here is the, the, uh, the playground area. And all the way over here is the man on his skateboard. So it's like you're a bird looking down. So, she, so Fran had to like imagine that she was way up high, like a drone or like a bird or an airplane or a helicopter, something where she could look down on that picture. And I just love that. And there's a beautiful bird. If you are... Um, if you um, look for Fran Preston Gannon's other books, she does beautiful, beautiful nature all the time. Not, not every one of her books is about nature, but a lot of them are. So if you love nature and you love birds and animals and fish and all kinds of things, her illustrations are gorgeous in that regard. Okay, so that's Busy Eye Day, and I hope you liked that one. Okay, I'd also like to read you a book that I wrote, this was my second book, and I wrote it a good while ago. And the reason that I wanted to read it today is that A Teacher for Bear is about a boy, well, a bear, named Bear. And Bear is ready to start school. And he thinks he knows exactly what it's going to be like. And when he gets there, it turns out that it's not at all like he thought it was going to be. And I think that's something that a lot of us are facing right now, is what we planned our lives to be like for the next three or four weeks or however long is not what's happening right now. And so I think, you know, in the beginning, Bear is, is sort of bummed and sort of frustrated. But at the end, he finds some ways to make these changes work for him. And so that's why I wanted to read um, A Teacher for Bear to you today. So um, A Teacher for Bear is by me. The words are by me, and it's illustrated by Mike Wonutka. So, um, and he's an illustrator who lives, I think, in the Midwest, so, um, so pretty far from me. So I want to ask another question before I start. Um, can you guys see this one? Where are you watching from? The East Coast, the Western part of the U.S., the Central part of the U.S., or outside the U.S.? I'm interested to see where people are watching from. So if you would answer that question, I would love it. And now I'm going to read. A teacher for bear. And again, this is a shiny cover, so it's glossy, but I think it will be uh, less glossy um, inside. Okay. A teacher for bear. 
Bear knew everything there was to know about school before he even got there. His older sister, Bella, had told him all about it. Every morning, Miss Fern stands at the classroom door to shake hands, Bella said. Then you'll have circle time, reading time, and snack. I like to be the helper. When it's time to go home, Miss Fern shakes hands again, but instead of saying goodbye, she says, see you when you're older. On the first day, Bear sent Mama away at the schoolhouse door. He wasn't afraid because he knew just what to expect. All by himself, Bear marched down the hall to Miss Fern's classroom and stuck out his hand, ready to shake. Miss Fern smiled when she saw him, but instead of shaking hands, Hello, Bear, she said. We have so many new students that there are two teachers now. You are in Miss Teasel's class across the hall. Bear looked. There was no teacher there to shake his hand. Inside the new classroom, Miss Teasel was handing out name tags. Hello, Bear, she said. You may take a seat and decorate this. While Bear colored, he kept looking at the clock. Two minutes passed, then five. Miss Fern must have started circle time by now, but Miss Teasel was still walking around the room, talking to the other students. Finally, Bear got up and tugged on Miss Teasel's sleeve. When is circle time, he asked. We don't have circle time, Bear. Miss Teasel said. First we do art, and then we have morning meeting. Miss Fern has circle time first, Bear said. I see, Miss Teasel said. Well, I do things differently. But Bear wanted to do things the way Bella had told him. He didn't want to do things differently. After morning meeting, Miss Teasel clapped her hands. It's time for story carpet, everyone, she called. The children gathered on the rug in front of the room. Miss Fern calls it reading time, Bear said. I see, Miss Teasel said. Well, I do things differently. But Bear didn't want to do things differently. At snack time, Miss Teasel brought out juice and graham crackers. Can I be the snack helper, Bear asked. Thank you for offering, Bear, but handing out snacks is my job. Miss Fern, Bear started. I know, Miss Teasel, Teasel started. You do things differently, Bear finished. Miss Teasel knelt down beside him. Bear, I get the feeling you wanted to be in Miss Teasel's class. Bear looked down at his feet. Yes, he said, I knew her already. My sister Bella was in her class. Do you want to know a secret, Miss Teasel asked. Bear nodded. Miss Fern was my teacher too. I want to be a good teacher like she is, but I don't want to be a copycat. I want to do it my own way. Bear nodded, but he didn't really understand. He tried to eat his graham crackers, but he wasn't very hungry. Nothing was turning out the way he had expected. After snack time, Miss Teasel passed out colored paper. We are going to make autumn leaves to decorate the classroom, she said. Bear listened to Miss Teasel's directions. He started to cut his colored paper according to her pattern. Suddenly he got a different idea. There was a tree in his yard with leaves shaped just like a mitten. Instead of Miss Teasel's pattern, he wanted to use his hand. Why aren't you using the pattern, Bear? Miss Teasel asked gently. Bear set his chin on his hands and looked up at his teacher. I don't want to be a copycat, he said. I want. Bear stopped for a second. You want to do it your own way? Miss Teasel asked. That's fine, Bear. Bear nodded and got to work. He traced his hand on the paper using a red crayon. Then he used the scissors to cut his leaf out. Finally, he colored it. Why, Bear, Miss Teasel exclaimed. What a wonderful leaf. Bear felt very proud. Miss Teasel knelt beside him. You know, Bear, you and I are a lot alike. We like doing things our own special ways. That doesn't mean we can't do some things that other people do. Is there one thing you'd like me to do the same way as Miss Fern? Bear whispered in Miss Teasel's ear. That afternoon, when it was time to go home, Miss Teasel stood at the door to say goodbye to her students. See you when you're older, 
she said. When it was Bear's turn, instead of shaking Miss Teasel's hand like everyone else, he gave her a high five. I see we're doing things our own special way, Bear, Miss Teasel said, smiling. Bear nodded. We sure are. And that is the story of Bear and his new teacher. And how do I make this less shiny? There we go. Oh, that works. That works. Okay. So, okay. So I thought about this, reading this story to you guys that I wrote. This is a story that I wrote a long time ago. Oop, I hope someone else in my house answers that phone call very quickly. I wrote a story a number of years ago. And um, and I thought it also sort of fit what we're what we're all dealing with right now, making things that are different from what we expected them to happen. The only thing is about reading this story is that it doesn't have any pictures. So what I'm hoping is that if you all will listen very carefully to the story, that maybe you would draw a picture later that goes along with the story and email it to me or to the Virginia Children's Book Festival. Or you can post it um, on the Virginia Children's Book Festival page as a comment underneath this, the archive of this video. Um, so I would love to see a picture that you draw based on the story that I'm going to read you. This is a story that I wrote um, when I was just starting my writing career, um, and I was writing for children's magazines, and this story is called Lemonade Afternoon, and I couldn't find the magazine itself. It's in a file somewhere, but this is the picture that the illustrator drew that went along with it. So we don't have pictures for this one, so I'm hoping that you guys will send some pictures to us. And um, so try to just sit and enjoy the story and maybe close your eyes and try to imagine what's going on. Okay. Lemonade afternoon. Mom didn't catch the flu on purpose, but her timing couldn't have been worse. Amanda had two weeks to finish her living skills project, but as usual, she'd put it off until the last minute, planning to cook dinner for dad's birthday as her project. Now mom was too sick to get the groceries. No birthday dinner, no project. Even though mom was in bed, she was irritatingly cheerful about the whole thing. We'll order pizza. Dad won't mind a simple dinner. And I already baked the cake. You can frost it. When life hands you a lemon, she said, sneezing her way through tissue after tissue, you just have to make lemonade. Amanda picked up her little sister Elizabeth and walked out, resisting the urge to slam mom's bedroom door. You just have to make lemonade, she mimicked, rolling her eyes. I want some lemonade, said Elizabeth. I'm thirsty. Not real lemonade, silly, Amanda said. Mom's that meant that when something bad happens, you should turn it into something good, which in this case is impossible. Well, at least there'd be cake. Mom had left a can of frosting on the counter. I want to help, Elizabeth said. Just what I need, thought Amanda. Chocolate frosting everywhere. No, Elizabeth, she said. You get to make the card. She quickly got out some paper and markers and wrote, Happy Birthday, Dad, in bright green ink. Soon, Elizabeth was happily scribbling. Amanda had learned to frost a cake in living skills. A little lumpy on top, she thought as she finished icing the cake, but not bad. She could put candles on the lumps. Now for the card. Done, Elizabeth? She asked. She looked over at the table. The card was there, covered with purple zigzags, but Elizabeth and the markers had disappeared. A green line led across the floor and out the kitchen door. Elizabeth was gazing into the hall mirror. Got lipstick, she said, holding up a marker. Amanda's shoulders sagged. Elizabeth had purple and green circles around her eyes and mouth. Her arms had blue stripes. She looked like a technicolor raccoon. Stay here and don't move, Amanda said. I'm going to fill the tub. Too bad living skills is concentrating on cooking this grading period, Amanda thought. If we were studying childcare, the bath could be a project. She went back to get Elizabeth, but her little sister had disappeared again. This time, she was in the kitchen. I put candles on the cake, Elizabeth said proudly. Amanda's cake head began to pound. Elizabeth had dug the markers into the cake so far that chunks of yellow cake showed through the frosting. Leaving the markers where they were, she dragged Elizabeth to the bathtub. This day was definitely a lemon. While Elizabeth played in the tub, Amanda thought about her project and about her mother's words. Sometimes you have to make lemonade. Things weren't completely awful. 
there would be a birthday dinner, even if it was only pizza. The cake would taste good, even if it had magic markers stuck in it, and only a trace of purple marker remained around Elizabeth's eyes. The only thing missing was ice cream and her project. Or could there be ice cream? And could ice cream be a project? Amanda grabbed her living skills book and turned to the index, G-H-I, ice cream, page 143. The recipe called for a cup each of milk, cream, and sugar. Amanda checked the fridge, then the cabinet. All the ingredients were there. But how would she freeze it? A bowl wouldn't work. She needed something to fit inside something else, like an old-fashioned ice cream freezer. With a real ice cream freezer, you put the ice cream mixture into a small bucket, then put that into a big bucket with lots of ice. A crank turned a paddle in the inner bucket to help keep the ice cream freeze evenly. A coffee can might work, small and large coffee cans. Mom kept empty clean ones in the bottom of the pantry. Amanda measured the ingredients into a small can. Well, she thought, this is making the best of things. This is making lemonade. That gave her another idea. She took a bottle of lemon extract from the cabinet, measured out a tablespoon, and stirred it into the ice cream mixture before covering it. She placed the small can inside a larger one, packed ice all around it, and covered the large can. Now, to freeze it evenly. Come here, Elizabeth, Amanda said. We're going to play a game. She showed Elizabeth how to roll the coffee can back and forth across the kitchen floor. Just then, Mom came downstairs. What are you two up to, Mom asked. It's my new and improved living skills project, much better than some old chicken dinner, Amanda said. But what's in the can, Mom asked. Well, Mom, if life hands you a lemon, you don't have to make lemonade. You can make lemon ice cream. Amanda picked up the telephone. Let's order Dad's birthday pizza. He'll be home soon, and I'm starving. And that is the story of Lemonade Afternoon. I would love to see if you guys would draw a picture to go along with Lemonade Afternoon. I would love to see what you come up with. Um, also, I, I would like to point out that you can Google how to make ice cream using either coffee cans or using plastic baggies, although coffee cans, I don't know, plastic baggies, you know, we want to conserve and not use too many of those, but you probably have some, and maybe after you use them, you can rinse them out and use them again. But you can Google how to make that kind of ice cream on the internet, and, um, you know, that might be a fun project to do sometime too. Um, and some of the articles about how to do that will explain the science between um, about making ice cream and how the cold makes it freeze and so forth. So um, a couple of things you could do based on what we've talked about today. You might write a story based on something that has been going on around you. You could draw a picture about Lemonade Afternoon. You could do a science project where you make ice cream or some other delicious thing that's available. Um, and, you know, you can always read. Um, I hope you have some books in your house that you can read that you love. Um, you know, some people say if you don't have a book yet that you love, it's just because you haven't found the right book yet. So if you haven't found a book that you love yet, I hope you'll keep looking. So that is what I have planned for today was to read those two books, talk a little bit about ideas and, and give you some ideas for things that you could do. Now, again, I would like to thank Juanita Giles and the Virginia Children's Book Festival for having me here to kick off the first ever Facebook Live Fest. It's, it's really been fun. Um, I thank you for answering your poll questions. I will share those with you afterwards. I'd like you to remind you that the people that are scheduled right now are Russell Gins, Lamar Giles, Todd Parr, Lewin Pham, who's the illustrator of Vampirina Ballerina, as well as many other books, and John Marciano um, in the next two weeks. And stay tuned to the um, announcement of even more, because I know that there are more authors and illustrators going to do these Facebook Live at um, – and I think they're even going to have to go. There are so many that I think they're even going to have to go to daily, not just Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, if any of the books that you hear on my um, my time today or any of the others, um, there's a link to Chop Suey Books. Chop Suey is a, a Richmond bookstore. They have a cat in their store. It's so cute. And Chop Suey has been a good friend to the Virginia Children's Book Festival for all the years that VCBF has been around. So if you're looking for books, um, either, you know, not just mine, any books that you might want, I would urge you to order them from Chop Suey or from your favorite independent bookstore because right now independent bookstores really need a boost. Um, 
And I, again, I would also like to thank um, Beach Lane, Simon and & Schuster, and Scholastic for allowing me to read the books that I read to you today. Um, if you have any questions for me, um, you can find me on the um, you can find me on Facebook, although I don't have it set up so that just anyone can message me, but I, I will look for them. You can also find me at my website, which is annemariepace.com, and my email is annemarie at annemariepace.com, and I would love to hear from you. Um, you know, if you want to write to the Virginia Children's Book Festival with suggestions or ideas for other live events, please um, write to Juanita. Um, check out the website, which is... Um, um, Virginia Children's Book Festival. Um, if you Google that, then the website will come up. Thank you so much for joining me today. This has been really fun, and I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Bye.